so. There's more data than ever in the world today. The good news is we can do more things with it that we never could before. It's growing at an accelerating pace. The bad news is that it leads to a whole host of problems with which society is completely unprepared. The dark side of big data cannot be ignored. But while many people see it in terms of problems, I don't. I see sort of an opportunity. I see a solution. But it's to be sure that when big data goes bad, the harms are easy to see. Just last January, Mike Say in Chicago came home to see his, his wife crying in the kitchen. When he raced to comfort her, she thrust this envelope into his hands. Underneath his name, it stated, daughter killed in car crash. The company who was sending out the junk meal had bought it from a mailing list, his address with all the others, and that stray piece of information just landed out on top of the envelope. Target targets. It uses data analytics with which to understand shopping patterns. And one of those things is whether shoppers are pregnant. Now, it's not as hard as you think. It's quite easy, in fact, because women who are pregnant shop for different things during the course of their pregnancy. Early on, it might be vitamin supplements. Later on, it might be unscented lotions. And by following this, you can learn if they're pregnant or not and target coupons for them. So one day in Minneapolis, a man rushes into a Target store, demands to see the manager, and yells at him and says, you've sent these coupons to my teenage daughter. She's still in high school. Are you just trying to get her pregnant? Trying to encourage her? Sure enough, the manager looks at the coupon, sees the smiling baby, sees the baby products, and sees the daughter's address and name on it, apologizes. He calls back a few days later, and the man, now this time the man replies, it's I who have to apologize to you. It turns out there's been some things going on in my household that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> She's due in August. <laughs> Many times, we start to equate big data with big brother. And we think of it in terms of unwanted ads online. But the stakes are far larger. The landscape of the 20th century is blood-soaked with ways in which data abetted evil ends. The Nazis used an IBM Holorith machine with which to manage the logistics of the final solution. There are punch card systems that predated the actual computer, but worked like computers. The numerical designation for Auschwitz was 0, 0, 1. In the category of race, 12 meant gypsy. Eight meant Jew. Death was a digit. Five, suicide. Four, execution. The numbers tattooed onto the arms of concentration camp prisoners corresponded to the IBM Holerith numbering system. And to a vastly lesser extent, incomparably lesser, even the United States was not immune to using data in terrible ways. In World War II, the Census Bureau handed over block addresses of the Japanese in America so they could be sent to internment camps. But they blacked out the names and the street addresses to maintain the appearance that they weren't improperly disclosing that information. Students, housewives, a chemist born in America, working at a government lab. Since then, of course, we've learned that the US government is collecting a vast quantity of information. Most international telephone calls, the GPS of cell phone users, the messages that video game players send while they're playing the video game to each other. Every single sender and every single receiver listed on an envelope in the physical post in the United States is recorded and stored. Now, in America, the intelligence community works hard to protect people, to keep them safe in a dangerous world. And we can appreciate that 
but we can also ask the question, are they collecting too much? Are the legal constraints sufficient? As we enter the big data era, it sometimes seems like we're on the losing side of the battle for privacy, for freedom, and for dignity. Governments know more than ever before. Companies know more than ever before. And this undermines the sanctity of the self. Now, just as privacy is important, perhaps there's one issue that's become even bigger and more important, and that is propensity. It's the idea that algorithms will pre be predicting what we are likely to do, and we may be held accountable for them before we've actually acted. It's like the World Minority Report in pre-crime. We are punished by a prediction. So if, if the algorithm says that this fellow over there has a 95% likelihood of committing a crime in the next six months, what should society do? If we don't act on that information, we're being anti-science. But the fellow can certainly say, 95% prediction? That means by your own probability, I have a 1 in 20 chance of exercising moral choice and doing the right thing at a given time. Will the legal standard of probable cause transform into probabilistic cause? If we deny free will, we deny something fundamentally human. So we will need to preserve free will in the big data era and human agency and human volition just as we safeguard free expression since the printing press. Because technology changes society's values. It brings an awareness of interests that we didn't know that we had prior to the introduction of that technology. When Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, he did not base his defense on free speech because the concept did not exist. It took the explosion of information from the printing press for people to realize that ideas worth spreading are also worth protecting. And who owns this information? Is it the individual who the information comes from, or is it the company who invested in collecting it? And can they use it for anything, any way at all, once they've collected it? Is big data a black box, a new form of alchemy that lacks the transparency and accountability that we come to expect from technologies and all other aspects of society? Ultimately, the problem is this, the Nike fuel band. Okay, it's not the Nike fuel band. The problem is Moore's law, but the Nike fuel band is a very good emblem of what these problems are. The device is loaded with sensors and technologies, and in the past, that cost a fortune. Today, it costs next to nothing. And as Moore's law continues, where we can do more things with technology at less cost all the time, year in, year out, these issues come to the fore. Today, the fuel band monitors mainly our steps and our sleep. Tomorrow, it will be our vital signs and our biochemistry. The technology is always becoming more powerful. An iPhone is 30 million times more powerful than the early computers in the 1950s, at the dawn of the information age. And this feature of society is always going to continue. We see nothing to stop it. We're generating more data, and we're collecting more personal information about all of us. So what is the solution? So how do we minimize the harms that big data bring, while at the same time allow for us to accept the benefits that we can get from using data wisely. I propose that we change the way we think about the issue altogether. Instead of thinking of the data as something separate from us, we should think of it as something uniquely and inherently a part of all of us. We can think of data in the context of human rights, the same as way as the French Revolution established the natural rights of man in 1789. The data that we generate around us, we have an inalienable interest in, an inalienable human right in. We can think of the data as a property right. The 17th century philosopher John Locke derived the principle of property rights, including intellectual property rights, from the idea that a person owns his body and his labor. Perhaps it's time we extend that 
to the data a person generates, too. If we did, we would protect data like we protect money in a bank. The data is an asset. We could protect it better, and we could make it li liquid by trading it on markets. And by trading it on markets, we can help determine its value. So we can set up data exchanges, much as we have stock exchanges today. More transactions, a more liquid marketplace, means that the market for personal data would become more efficient. Markets are great at self-organizing to manage complex issues. Think about it. It happens everywhere. We just don't look. Banking creates a market for capital. Insurance creates a market for risk. Patents create a market for innovation. This idea of taking a resource, creating a property interest around it, happened to land in the 18th century. It's called the enclosure movement. Prior to that period, land, much land, was not formally owned. It was used by the public. During the enclosure movement, it became private. It was closed off. People were outraged by it, but today we can see that often, although not always, the private ownership of a scarce resource enables that resource to be used the most efficiently and to prevent depletion, if you will, the tragedy of the commons. What would that mean for privacy? Well, we could imagine our phones and our computers tracking what data is collected and with whom it's shared, creating an inventory that we then can control. And we might even know whether the data is shared with other people and moves on from that initial collection, just as iTunes somehow knows when I try to take content and put it on more than three devices. But if data is a human right, and if we attach a property right around it, if we treat it like an asset and take care of it as if it were like money, we need more than a market to let it be traded and to be valued. We need new institutions to protect it, because markets only work when there's regulation. We need to regulate personal data like we regulate banking or nuclear energy. Like banking, those digital bits are very valuable. And like nuclear reactors, any breach, any accident can be toxic. Perhaps we need to have regulation of the strictest possible sort, a Sarbanes-Oxley for personal data. So if a CEO should violate it, make any infraction, he may go to jail. If we turn privacy into private property, we also need its opposite, an area where property rights do not apply. Now, that's not open data. It's more like public domain for data, a data commons, sort of a pool where everyone can access it and tap into it. Think of it like a public good, like roads or libraries or na national parkland. So in the case of healthcare, you can imagine all patient data on an anonymized basis will go into this commons where researchers can analyze it to lower the cost of treatment and find ways to improve the quality of care. In education, all the information around a student experience and the teaching experience can be shared together to find ways to improve the way that students learn and teachers teach. Perhaps if we value personal data like other assets and protect it, we can create institutions and rules that will give us confidence to participate in a market for privacy like we trust other creations and institutions, like paper money. Mike Say in Chicago would not get a letter that says, daughter killed in car crash. But this solution is limited, too. It would not do so much for the willful misuse of data by the state there, the data might still be hard to get at, but it could still be abused, just as the Nazis raced in and stole art collections and seized assets. What is certain, though, is that we cannot move forward unless we change the way we imagine the world and the role of data in it. But we've met similar challenges like that in the past, whenever we need to identify new interests because the underlying setting of the technology changes. 
We need to rethink our assumptions to protect privacy in the digital age. But this, humil this humility is a good place to start. <laughs>